pleasure to welcome to the program MSNBC and NBC correspondent Jacob Sabroff on his book, Separated Inside an American Tragedy. Uh, Jacob, uh, welcome to the program. And, you know, I was saying uh, before we got on, uh, uh, you know, both congratulations on uh, on the book and the many awards that you won for your reporting. But also, you know, I just want you to know uh, how much it's appreciated. It's a, a really important story. And um, you were one of the, the key figures, in my mind, who, who, who got it uh, wider attention. Thanks, Sam. I, I appreciate that. And it's good to be on with you. And, and you know, look, I, uh, I happen to be at the right place at what really was the wrong time for all of those children and their families. And there were certainly other reporters like my colleague Julia Ainsley and Lomi Creel from the Houston Chronicle and Caitlin Dickerson, who, who were really way more dialed into this than I was. But um, unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I did. I had the misfortune of seeing this with my own eyes and, and, it, and it changed me um, forever. That's for sure. The, I mean, this is, um, and I, I had said before you came on, it's, it's, it's more or less a, uh, a memoir of your reporting. You follow um, through the, the book a, um, uh, a man and his teenage son as they attempt to, um, it, it, or I should say, you retell their story, um, how they uh, attempted to seek asylum uh, in this country from, uh, from Guatemala. Uh, and, and largely, I mean, the, the story of, this administration is, it seems to me, is, you know, this answers the question of uh, stupid uh, or evil. It doesn't have to be either or uh, in many respects in the way they handle this. But I want to start with this. Um, separated. This is a um, maybe double entendre is too uh, strong of a word, but uh, the, the title means uh, two things to you. W explain that. It does. It does. It, I mean, to me, it, it, it's... Obviously, physically, what happened to Juan and Jose, who you mentioned, the father and son from Guatemala, who were um, separated for nearly five months, uh, Juan nearly deported without his son, coerced into signing away the right to reunite. Um, and there were, you know, 400 parents who were not as lucky as him to have an immigration, lucky is not the right word, but fortunate to have an immigration lawyer who won his freedom and his reunification. Um, and the torture and the trauma. Um, and those aren't even my words. Those are American Academy of Pediatrics, um, Physicians for Human Rights. I, I mean, this was a government sanctioned, tortured program of these children in the words of uh, Physicians for Human Rights, the Nobel Peace Prize winning organization. And that's the very literal definition of separated. Um, and then to me, what separated really means, and I think it's probably the more important definition, is I think a, a mental separation that too many of us, myself included, had from the reality of what's been going on in our country for decades with regard to immigration enforcement, a bipartisan deterrence-based immigration enforcement that stretches back um, at least to the Clinton administration, uh, ran through the Bush, Obama years, and Donald Trump supersized it like no one else had ever done. And certainly he's the only president to systematically separate children like this. Um, but it's the idea that this, that that this, he was teed up to do this. He was teed up to do this by the American immigration system. And so that's the other way I look at separated. And it's why I call the book um, Inside an American Tragedy, because that's really what this is. You know, this is the United States of America where this happened. Well, I mean, just give us a little bit of the, of the history so that, you know, the um, uh, people can understand qualitatively um, w what happened here uh, in, in terms of the difference of uh from the obama administration now the obama administration set a record for for deporting people um and they sure did. and and they were the ones or at least under the obama administration is when this sort of the the genesis of this idea took place but my understanding is that it was um quickly dispensed with but there were some holdovers i mean talk about uh, the 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 difference correct qualitatively and quantitatively in the policies yeah, so family separations did happen during the Obama administration in a very limited capacity, always um, with the safety and the security, the best interest of the child as the deciding factor. There were certainly people within the administration, um, career, uh, generally law enforcement officials who had wanted to try separations as a larger deterrence method. And you're right, the Obama administration um, was harshly criticized by immigration activists and lawyers and um, advocates who 
who who rightly criticized them for deporting more people than anyone in American history, any president in American history. But when family separations made it to the Situation Room, and I, Cecilia Munoz and Jay Johnson are both on the record in the book, um, the idea was dismissed outright. The idea that you would systematically separate every parent and child coming into the country in order to scare them away from coming here, because the medical experts said this will traumatize them for life. Uh, uh, and, and there's one expert who was involved in the separations on the on the um, ORR side who said to me in the book, you know, childhood trauma means a century of suffering. And I think that the Obama administration realized that. And it was after the Trump administration came into office, but but really not long after. I write about in the book a meeting on Valentine's Day 2017, um, just weeks after the president was sworn in, in the office of Kevin McAleen and then the acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, where officials were in a celebratory mood, according to people who were in the room, uh, you know, miming, stamping passports with denied for migrants coming to the country asylum applications. Uh, and it was in that meeting that the idea of family separation again came up and it was soon uh, forced out into the public by by Julia Ainsley, who I mentioned. Um, then John Kelly confirmed it on CNN, talking to Wolf Blitzer. And after, you know, a really brief um, uh, public outrage uh, in the very early days of the administration, they didn't talk about it again until it exploded in the spring of 2018. But all along, they were working on this. And in El Paso, they had a pilot program. And those 700 children that Caitlin Dickerson reported on um, were being separated, despite the fact that uh, the administration said they pulled back from the policy. And just to, to put a really fine point on it, Nobody's ever done what the Trump administration did. It was deliberate. It was systematic. You know, I detail it very extensively in the book. And that's despite the best efforts of people trying to stop it from within the government. And so uh, and to be clear, my understanding is that when the Obama administration would separate uh, children from their parents, it was a function of the parent having committed a uh, a crime beyond to the extent that it's, a, you know, a, it's a civil offense, but a, 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 a crime beyond crossing the border. Uh, um, but it had to do with like if they were in possession of drugs or if there was some type of a, a, a abuse that was going on. Whereas and, and, and like you say, it was entertained in the situation room as a method of deterrence. Like, hey, things are going to be so horrible for you. We're going to take your children away. Don't come here. Um, and, yep. and that's what was ultimately adopted by the Trump administration. There was some machinations involved in, in criminalizing going across the border um, in, in a slightly different way so that there was sort of like a, a legal apparatus in which this was done. But so I want to talk about this point because this that, that part about that you write about the, the, the reporting that you have of, of celebration. I mean, to me, that seems indicative of a uh, a cultural problem at the the you know uh at the uh customs uh border patrol uh that 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 seems a little problematic i mean i guess i mean you want people to be excited about their job but it's not necessarily like you know people think that their job is just to keep immigrants out um it, it, maybe that's a problem <laughs> yeah don't forget you know and i write about this too in the book the only time i've ever come face to face with Stephen Miller was in a Colorado ballroom during the primaries um, in 2016. And, um, you know, their whole campaign promise was to end catch and release. Um, the act of releasing asylum seeking uh, families into the interior of the country uh, as they await their immigration proceedings. And this was the, this was the dream scenario for the right wing ideological folks in the administration and some of the career folks in law enforcement. And I, I should say, like, I've met many compassionate, caring uh, line agents from the Border Patrol, um, Customs and Border Protection officials at the ports of entry, uh, and officials up and down the chain of command. And many of them spoke out to me, um, also from, from HHS, about what they saw as the cruelty of this policy. But there were people and it's no secret that, you know, they were uh, ideologically aligned with Stephen Miller, uh, who really wanted this to happen and pushed for it from the earliest days. And they uh, they obviously um, they obviously were successful. That's that's what all, where th what this boils down to is they pro I mean, we should have seen it coming. They promised it. 
The president talked about it on the stage at the Republican National Convention as I stood there in the middle of the Texas delegation with surrounded by people wearing cowboy hats. And it just didn't occur to me. And that's where that's why I write about this from a personal perspective. I missed it, too. Right. Like I ended up being one of the journalists who documented this firsthand and saw the conditions with my own eyes. Yet the fact that it happened and the fact that and I could the fact that I couldn't believe what I was seeing with my own eyes is in some measure my own fault because this was laid out. Um, this was laid out very clearly and only by going back and digging deeper and learning about the meaning you talk about um, and many other subsequent, you know, key inflection points did I learn how premeditated this was. Um, and not only, I used to say there's no plan to reunite. There was no plan to separate. I was wrong. There were plans to reunite. They were just rejected um, passed over, ignored by the Trump administration who wanted to do this so badly, they pushed it into existence without waiting for a mechanism to be able to even put children and parents back together uh, if and when the policy was ended. All right. So let's talk about some of those inflection points. Uh, you mentioned that th- that it is revived, you know, early in 17 uh, as an idea. Kelly has to uh, admit it. People assume it goes away. What happens with that policy after that? Like, what is the, uh, uh, how does it wind its way back into actually being executed? Uh, it, it starts with that pilot program. That's right. And, and this was in the El Paso sector of the Border Patrol, obviously directly across the border from Ciudad Juarez. Um, and they began separating uh, in the summer of 2017. Um, and if were it not for the reporting of Lomi Creel, who I mentioned from the Houston Chronicle, this would have never surfaced. Um, but when it did surface, it was it was basically quickly shut down by Kevin McAleen. And I write about this, you know, and I have the emails between him and, and Gloria Chavez and Carla Provost, key Border Patrol officials, um, basically flagging that this was coming out in reporting and in newspaper articles, and they decided to, to stop it. Um, and so it was shut down for a time. But that was the beginning of the development of the national policy with people from within the Department of Justice, um, Homeland Security, and ultimately Health and Human Services, who were very keenly aware of how badly this would uh, injure psychologically um, the children. And there's one gentleman, Commander Jonathan White, who was the ultimately the the federal health coordinating official who was tasked with putting these children back together, uh, who continued to warn McAleenan. Um, and got on the phone with him, as a matter of fact, and there are the emails to document this in the book uh, to say, look, if you're going to do this, not only do you need to have the bed space, and and they talked about separating as many as 30,000 children, five times as many as they ultimately separated before it was stopped, you know, amidst the outrage. Um, and they went forward with it anyways. That, that That's where, you know, that's where I want everybody to to focus, to realize. I mean, the thing that I realized is that they could have stopped this. The Trump administration could have stopped this. The child welfare experts attempted to stop this. Even people within ICE attempted to stop it. There's a woman named Claire Trickler McNulty as, as um, CBP and ICE you know, started talking about this more going into 2018, that the technological systems weren't in place in order to be able to put the family and children back together because it was simply an IT deficiency. They couldn't keep track of both because Kids were cared for by HHS and adults were cared for by DHS and the systems didn't talk to each other in a sufficient way. And uh, McNulty and others in ICE uh, alerted their supervisors to that and their own boss, Thomas Homan, along with McAleenan uh, and Francis Cisna from US uh, CIS, the, le- the legal immigration portion of DHS, all signed a, a memo recommending to Kirsten Nielsen to adopt the policy, uh, which she ultimately did. And, um, but there was also, uh, in terms of, of Nielsen adopting that policy, there were DHS lawyers, at least one who, who wrote like, this could be a violation of, of, of multiple laws. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. John Mitnick, who was a official in the Bush administration, then went to Raytheon, then came back into the Trump administration to become the general counsel, um, of DHS warned in a previously unpublished legal memo that, Family separations were potentially violative of several American laws, and more importantly, the U.S. Constitution, that they would violate the constitutional, the due process rights of migrants coming to this country. Uh, And 
Kirsten Nielsen got that advice. And when she got the memo, uh, this legal memo from Mitnick, which was attached to the decision memo I just described to you from her, her three deputies, the truth is she didn't sign it right away. She had it and didn't, you know, she had it in late April and didn't sign it until early May. And it sat on her desk. She considered, obviously, the fact that um, she was given this advice. By the way, in the meantime, she was preparing for an interview with me um, in, in early May for a Dateline documentary we were doing. And the, the emails are in the book, you know, that she was also focused on that. Um, and she she went forward with signing on the dotted line for option three of uh, family separations, even though um, she was very clearly warned. And you can read it for yourself that it could be a violation of the Constitution. Um, no, so, you know, it just rings hollow to me. I should just say it just rings hollow to me when. There's any I haven't seen much remorse, you know, expressed by her, but she has spoken out publicly in the wake of this. And the idea that, you know, um, this was anybody but her decision, ultimately, is is for me, it's hard to hard to swallow. Well, so when was it that she signed that memo? I think it was May 4th or May 5th, 2018, um, early May, the first week of May. And we should say that is after. Right. Um, the, the ACLU has filed a lawsuit against, uh, ICE, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a woman- yeah, against family separation. That, that's what's so wild about it, Sam, is that Mitnick specifically, the general counsel of DHS specifically in the memo cited the what's known as the Miss L case, a Congolese mother who was separated at a legal port of entry because DHS claimed uh, CBP claimed she wasn't the mother. They didn't have biological proof. And not until they did a DNA test did they reunite them. They took her from her child, um, sent her to Chicago. She didn't even know what Chicago was, whether it was a man's name or a city or whatever. Kept her in this basement detention center and then moved her to another detention center in the San Diego area. And that was the lawsuit was filed in federal court in February 2018 by the ACLU and then later became a class action lawsuit. And Mitnick advised Nielsen that, hey, this case, uh, in this case, it's already in federal court. This whole policy could be thrown out on due process grounds. Uh, and and she knew it. She knew about the case because I have emails in the book that she was emailing about news articles about the case. And yet she still went forward with the policy. And she knows and she's also heard by uh, uh, from uh, Jonathan White, who you said, uh, commander of the U.S. Public Health Commission Corp. Uh, I guess it's part of HHS. I'm not 100 percent sure I even know what that is. Right. It's, uh, the, you know, they report to the Surgeon General. They're the folks you see. I mean, right now they're being dispatched to deal with the coronavirus. And that, by the way, that's the whole thing. It's like, you know, you had to send out public health officials that normally are dealing with the response and recovery to things like Hurricane Maria, um, another Trump disaster, uh, incidentally. Um, or tornadoes or public health emergencies. And instead they were forced to deal with the man-made disaster of, um, of, of psychological trauma, you know, thrust upon these children. So, okay. And, and then by um, um, May, or I guess it's April. So just like uh, somewhere around that time, the, um, the, the attorney general announces that we're going to have a zero tolerance policy which means that every uh, parent who comes across the border with a child will be separated. And then like, here's the thing that, that I, that I, that I, that I find just sort of stunning. They create this whole apparatus, not just, I mean, obviously to separate them at the border, you need to, there's logistics involved and, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the places in Texas that you saw, um, in, in Brownsville, in uh, McAllen, and one of them, which was a, an old Walmart. Um, but you have those, you have the logistics of like, how are we going to house these kids? Um, and everything that's involved in that, like, you know, maybe we'll bring in social workers. Maybe we won't at one point, maybe, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then they basically disperse them out to the wind. And I would imagine like there is, uh, a certain amount of 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 planning and um and 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 that's involved with with that and yet there's no they're not keeping any records essentially or any type of like central database right. where anybody's going exactly that's the problem that the record keeping was the problem because I have a lot of respect for folks that I've met in health and human services and specifically. 
Um, what I know about the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the, the small agency uh, under what's called Administration for Children and Families within HHS that cares for these children. But as our mutual friend, Chris Hayes, said at the time, these children who came with parents were rendered unaccompanied, right? There were, they were taken from their parents and put into a system designed for children who come to the country by themselves. So, you know, I think HHS and ORR got a lot of the animosity because that's where the children ended up. And I did see them, you know, in that former Walmart, the 250,000 square foot former Walmart in Brownsville. That was the first report that I had done on this that night on Chris's show. Um, but it wasn't, it, it, they, I think they were the wrong target, right? Because they, the kids wouldn't have ended up there in with professional licensed social workers um, was it not for the decision of the politicals in Homeland Security and the Trump administration? So they're and down. What, they're down HHS, what you're saying is they're downstream. Ahead. They're downstream on the on the decision exactly. tree, as it were, and 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 they're doing their best to deal with something that they have no policy control over. That's exactly right. And you know, I write about learning about this in real time in the book that these facilities had to get variances from their state governments because they're licensed childcare facilities in order to hold more kids than they were licensed for because they were they became overcrowded due to the separations from parents because they didn't expect they didn't calculate in fact I should say they did calculate um, and Jonathan White warned they should calculate separations could result in a huge influx of children but the administration didn't take the advice and they weren't ready for it so all of a sudden, in Casa Padre, the former Walmart, you've got 1,500 boys, ages 10 to 17. Hundreds of them had been separated from their parents. Instead of four beds per room, you've got five beds per room. You know, these children are uh, there, not expecting to be there, stuck inside 22 hours a day, you know, doing Tai Chi and watching Moana in the loading dock of a former Walmart. It just, it becomes this additional shock on top of this process of crossing taking one of the most dangerous journeys you can possibly take in the world in order to get here for refuge. And then all of a sudden, like Juan and Jose, they cross the border in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, Mexico. They get to Arizona and all of a sudden they're brought to the Yuma Border Patrol station and they're taken from one another and they didn't see each other for five months. And that's sort of that was the beginning of the process for all these kids. And you're right. The children ended up sort of in this downstream part of the process where they never would have ended up otherwise. Likely, they would have been released after maximum 20 days in detention because of the Flores Settlement Agreement. They would have been in the interior of the country waiting for their asylum hearings. And uh, for the ones that get lawyers, the vast majority of them end up showing up for those asylum hearings because they want to be here legally and they want, they want to be a part of American society. And, 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 and just to be clear, uh, the law of the United States is that you cannot seek asylum. Tell me if I'm wrong, but this is my understanding. You cannot seek asylum until you step on U.S. soil. And so the stepping on U.S. soil is actually part of the process of seeking asylum. And yet what, what Customs and Border Patrol was doing was saying, you stepped on U.S. soil, you're here illegally, we're going to separate you. You're under arrest. Yep. And, and even in between ports of entry, right? Like areas with walls or without walls, but not, not like the checkpoints you drive through if you're going to Mexico. Um, so you would encounter someone in a green uniform, a border patrol agent, rather than someone in a blue uniform, a customs person who like you, same kind of people you would see at the airport. Um, all, of the, all of the migrants, refugees that were crossing the border, including Juan and Jose, were looking to turn themselves in to the to the to the border patrol agents the line agents in the green uniforms they weren't looking to run away and be chased by the agents and escape into the interior of the country they wanted to see them say i'm here to seek asylum and juan and jose by the way were fleeing narco violence in their home community in peten the department in guatemala where the vast majority of drugs that come into the united states uh transit through you know and they got themselves uh, into some trouble not by their own fault but because they, uh, Juan had sold a vehicle and the narcos had wanted the vehicle and then threats were made on his life and then his son. Um, and so they decided to leave um, their wife and mother and, and siblings and travel together here. And so when they got here, the whole idea was, hey, Border Patrol, um, we want to be here. We want to start this asylum process. You know, please take us to the facility so that we can we can get going. And instead, 
that's when the separations were happening. And from the United States perspective, the idea is, okay, we, we want you to send a message to, um, you know, your family back in Guatemala and your friends and whoever that yep. there's no asylum opportunity here. If you come here, you're going to lose your child. And that's deterrence. I mean, that is how the Trump administration was teed up to do this. The Clinton administration in 1994, there was an official document that the Border Patrol um, produced called Prevention Through Deterrence, which said, you know, let's invest in technology and infrastructure and manpower uh, in order to make migrants. This was the first wave of walls cross through more dangerous and deadly um, locations or at least have to make that choice because it, maybe if they know that they won't come, you know, they want to risk their lives. Well, guess what? That deterrence never stops people from coming from desperate situations and people continue to come and people died in a greater um, percentage relative to the amount of people who were coming across the border. And DHS was obviously supersized during the Bush administration post 9-11. Obama did what he did. We've already discussed that. And then Trump took the idea of deterrence to this place where we're going to do something so horrible. And Katie Waldman, who is now Katie Miller, Stephen Miller's wife and the, the vice president's spokesperson, said it to me at the time. The idea is to not only scare the migrants, but disturb members of Congress um, to such an extent that seeing this act perpetrated on these families will get them to change the laws in order to be able to detain families indefinitely and to deport children who come here by themselves immediately, which which incidentally they're doing anyways now uh, under the guise of the coronavirus. I, 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 I was I was I was putting her in. Uh, I, I was I was I was saving her for, for, for a moment. But since we're, we're there, um, yeah. her the quotes that you have from her are I mean, people want to know what kind of person marries Stephen Miller uh, answer. The answer is in your book. Uh, but this I just want to reiterate this point that it's she is basically saying if we show families suffering enough at the border we will be playing on because this dynamic in terms of like democrats and republicans frankly it, it plays out in a, in a in a in a bunch of different ways but this dynamic is we're going to show these uh the 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 congress people how much suffering we're inflicting on people and that's going to provide the leverage for them to give us the less harsh version of what we want to accomplish it they is- all said it the president said it too it's the, you know now it's up to congress to change the laws and in fact it was in the executive order of four i think the, the official title of the executive order trump signed on june 20th 2018 was affording congress the ability to change immigration laws or something like that they wanted to use this to scare migrants from coming and to force congress to change the laws and they failed on on both counts uh, we should also say that she she she's she had a quote to you to the effect of like people told me if I go down to the border uh, or, or, you know, when I have children, my attitude towards this will change. Or if I go down to the border and see them suffering now, nah, didn't work. I, yeah, I, the, the full exchange and you read read it in the book to 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 get the you know, I want to I'll paraphrase it here. But basically, I was at the dinner with her and Katie Turr, uh, my colleague from from MSNBC. And we were shooting this documentary series, American Swamp, that we had done last year. And after one night of shooting, Katie and I sat down with Katie Miller, who was Kate, still Katie Waldman. And I think Katie Turr was curious and was asking her about, like, what was it like to, to defend the policy? And Katie said she told a version of the story that she had told me before and has told other people. Uh, and subsequent to the book coming out, other people have come forward and said they've heard similar versions of the story from her that she was sent to the border in order to become more compassionate and it didn't work uh, after we had all seen the separations. And I said to her, which I had said to her on multiple occasions as well, are you a white nationalist? I mean, you know, I'll never forget what I saw. Are you serious? Because I almost felt like you got to be kidding. And she said, no, but I uh, believe if you come to America, you should assimilate. Why do we have um, little Havana's? Or why should we have little Havanas? Again, look, get the exact language in the book. But um, uh, that was it right there, right? Like that's where this comes from within the administration. Despite the best efforts of people to stop it, that's the underlying uh, philosophy, feelings, ethos that allows someone, in my opinion, to defend this policy so vociferously, which she did, you know? And it's weird because... 
uh, I liked working with Katie Miller. She gave me access, as I write about in the book, to these facilities, and I wouldn't have seen them were it not for her. Um, she's a she's a she's a person who's easy to talk to and easy to be around, and I was as startled as anybody that not only she allowed herself to be in this position and defend this policy. And I consistently had conversations with her about that. Um, but that she would speak so openly about it in this way. And looking back today, now knowing what I know, you know, it just, it all makes so much more sense. Um, I, we, you'd mentioned the office of uh, refugee resettlement. Just talk a little bit about Scott Lloyd. I mean, I think these are, you know, uh, these are names that people should know because, um, you know, like you say, a lot of these people have been redeployed uh, to the coronavirus um, response to the extent that there is any from a federal standpoint. But it's also like, you know, the one of the problems I think we have in this country is that from administration to administration, uh, sometimes it's political appointees, sometimes it's um, it, it's uh, uh, career folks. Um, there's no accountability. And uh, which is why I think, you know, what you've written here is so important, particularly, you know, in regards to like Kristen Nielsen, who, you know, at various times has tried to pop her head up and start on some type of rehabilitation tour. Uh, but uh, Scott Lloyd, um, you, you write about him. Just tell us uh, 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 who, who he was. Sure, sure. He's, uh, Scott Lloyd's no longer in the government, but he was a lawyer for the Knights of Columbus who became the head of the Catholic, you know, fraternal organization that became the head of ORR. And, you know, he contends he had the experience. He had been to Iraq working on refugee issues. Um, and his first controversy in the Trump administration was around whether or not he was going to allow migrant women to receive abortions, young women, in the custody of ORR. And that caused Jonathan White, um, who was in charge of the, the Children's Refugee Program, to quit, uh, to go to another part of HHS. Uh, where he ultimately was tasked with sort of unwinding the mess of family separations. And Lloyd, what I write about Lloyd, and, and by the way, one official who worked closely with Lloyd says to me in the book, he's the most prolific, in his opinion, the most prolific child abuser in American history. Uh, the only quote Lloyd gave me on the record for the book was to dispute that, and you can read it in the epilogue. Um, Scott Lloyd, in reaction to Caitlin Dickerson's bombshell story on April 20th, I think it was in print on April 21st, 2018, ran into, again, Katie Waldman, Katie Miller, uh, who basically asked him about how did, how did the number 700 leak from inside ORR of separated children? Right, let, me, let me just uh, slow you down and, here so that people, let me just catch yeah, everybody up. So the first story comes out and it is about there being a, a, a list of 700 children who have been separated. And right. it, ostensibly it's the only sort of, record of who these kids are right and who their parents are yes theoretically and all right i just want to correct people up on that go ahead yeah just, sorry so i that's important to note orr was there's a guy by the name of jim de la cruz another career official who was keeping an informal list by the way he kept it back into the obama administration when they were separating kids on a on a piecemeal you know whatever the whatever the total number was a handful of times or you know, again, in this relative to the Trump administration, they they didn't separate anybody. But um, Jim De La Cruz kept this list. He was keeping it for years. And as the Trump administration ramped up separations, there were 700 kids on the list. Somehow, Caitlin Dickerson from the New York Times got her hands on the list and published the number that 700 children had been separated by the Trump administration. Scott Lloyd, who was responsible for those children, but also um, res responsive to the Trump administration as a political appointee was embarrassed. You know, he was called out by Katie, Katie Miller. Um, and over the weekend, he was sort of stewing about this article came out on a Friday about the fact that this had leaked on his watch, you know, uh, and embarrassed the administration that appointed him to his position. And instead of coming back to the office and saying, I'm glad we're keeping this list, you know, and I had been warned by people like Commander White um, that having separated children would be very detrimental to the health and the well-being of the children. His first instinct was, let's get rid of the list. And so he queried employees in ORR about why do we keep the list? Can't we just keep track of this on a piecemeal one-to-one -one level and just go back and forth with DHS, whatever? And then they all sit in a room with public affairs officials 
And the idea comes up again. And in that room, they say, why are we keeping the list? And the career employees felt, according to people who spoke with them at the time, that they had received direction from Lloyd to get rid of the list. And I write about um, two people in particular. I mentioned them, Jim Dela Cruz, but also Jalen Sulog, who refused to do so. They refused to get rid of the list that was a critical linkage between parents and children. Um, and had it been destroyed, had Scott Lloyd's instincts been followed through on, who knows what would have happened to those 700 children or, or whether or not they would have been able to be um, reunited. And Scott Lloyd, by the way, since the book's come out, has tweeted me acknowledging that he did briefly consider, in his words, getting rid of the list, um, but in, insists that the fact that the data about the kids was with ORR and the data with the parents was with DHS would have meant they would have ultimately been reunited. But that was the whole problem. And that's why they couldn't reunite children quickly in the first place, because there was no formal way to link DHS and HHS or our data. Um, and so, you know, this instinct by Scott Lloyd could have been potentially catastrophic, according to people who work there. Um, and, and again, were it not for these people who pushed back, uh, who knows what would have happened. How, how twisted do you have to be to say that my, that I, look, I was going to destroy the list, but it wouldn't have made a difference anyways. We probably would have been able to figure out whose kids they were. Like how twisted yeah, that's your it, defense. Your defense is, it's is just, that, I feel the same way. I, I, I feel the same way about Scott Lloyd as I do about Katie Miller. It's like, I, it's almost unbelievable that that would be the, the consideration. And if that's what, you know, it, what is it? Is it, is it malintent? Is it negligence? Is it cruelty? Is it some, some combination of all of them? Um, I guess that's for the readers of the book to judge, but I had the same reaction as you, you know, Scott Lloyd openly admitting that he considered this, by the way, he denied under oath in a question from Sheila Jackson Lee that he ever ordered the destruction of the list in congressional testimony. Um, and he also denied it to Dan Diamond, who first reported that this incident took place in Politico, which is what made me want to um, dig deeper into it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. You know, there, the, the psychological analysis of these folks is not, it's not my, it's not my expertise. I, could, I can't do it, but I, I react the same way that you did. You know, it, what, how, how else are you supposed to react? All right. So let's just, in terms of the numbers, there were uh, approximately 55, I mean, and I say approximately because we really don't know, right? We don't know how many kids were actually taken from their parents. Nope. Uh, we, kn we know that 5,400 are accounted for um, by the ACLU in this Miss L case, which is still going on, still going on in federal court two years later. We know that 2,800 or so were separated during the main zero tolerance um, crux of this policy. We know that over 1,000 were separated before when there really were virtually no records kept connecting them other than Jim De La Cruz's list. And then ACLU says over 1,000 have been separated since. And there are still parents and children uh, amongst those 5,400 who are not reunited. There's family reunification projects ongoing uh, with the ACLU and NGOs who go on the ground in Central America to literally look for parents in places like the highlands, the western highlands of Guatemala, or the dry corridor where I visited to see people fleeing due to starvation and malnutrition. Um, but because of the coronavirus, those efforts have been slowed down, if not stopped according to legal learn from the ACLU who I talked to last week. Uh, and, uh, and that, that, that's it. I mean, you know, you have this number of children um, there, by the way, and we haven't talked about, it, I'm sure we will. There's still 335 parents and kids on this Friday who could be separated by the Trump administration um, because they refuse to rule out. Um, they refuse to commit to releasing the families together. They're supposed to release the children by Friday after a judge's order, and they won't commit to releasing the, children detained in ICE detention today with their parents. All right. I, and, and I, and I want to touch on that, but so of the, of the 5,400, approximately 5,400 that, that, that we know of that were separated, do we have a sense of how many, like how many parents are out there, how many kids are out there and they, they don't, they haven't seen their parents now in maybe a couple of years. Uh, how many, how many exist? Do we, do we even know? 
We know that 400 parents were deported without their kids during the family separation policy until Trump signed the executive order ending it. We know that the majority of the 2,800 during that time period are accounted for and either reunited or placed with a sponsor, which might be a family member in the U.S. out of, you know, they're out of the government's custody. Um, but we don't know. We, we just don't. We don't know about the children separated before that time. Uh, and we won't until the coronavirus, you know, abates and these these lawyers on the ground are able to get to all the Parents, it really is a basically a detective game that um, many people have been spending their time on, you know, out of the spotlight, just trying to determine who was even separated and where they may be. I mean, it's just simple stuff like that. You know, I think for some cases they don't even have the the details to be able to do it because the separations, um, the accounting was so sloppy, you know, and that's a generous description. There there was no accounting, the connecting of the two. And so I don't have an, honestly, I don't have an answer for you. Legal Learn from the ACLU didn't have an answer for me when I asked them the other day, because um, now the coronavirus has made this, you know, increasingly more complicated. Are there kids who have been adopted? I mean, at one point there was like, you know, reports that, that the kids were being sent to adoption agencies. Are there kids who are like living with, with um, adopted or foster families with the, with I, I mean, a well, foster families, foster. Uh, I, the answer is I don't. I don't believe so. And I've seen a lot of talk online about this. You know, again, ORR is really serious about where children are ultimately placed, and there's a very stringent program for doing so. Um, if they were in a ORR foster family, they'd be considered in government custody. And okay. I, I don't. I think the last child in government custody was released um, from zero tolerance. Uh, late last year when the family reunification project brought um, brought parents back from Guatemala to be reunited with their children. Um, it's not out of the question for a kid in ORR custody to be placed with an adoption agency. And certainly it was warned that you could have permanent orphans. Um, but I think the, the reality of the permanent orphan situation is more like parents and children who came here together were separated. A child ends up with a family member in the United States um, and is unable to be reunited with their parent. Uh, I'm not but, saying, but at the least that they're, you know, you know I don't maybe know. I can't, in contact I can't say for sure it never, it never happened, but, but as far as I know, those are really more the, the types of situations that these children find themselves in. All right. So, so talk about this case, uh, with, uh, the, I guess is going down the, the, on the 18th, um, the, what, what, what is the circumstance? I mean, the, the American government continues to do this. They don't do it in the same way with the same hopes, do they? I mean, the, the, the Trump administration has sort of given up or, or have they not on the idea that like, if we can separate uh, children from their families, then people in Guatemala will get the message. And, and, and I have one other question about that theory too. Why would they yeah. then like the, why were they so hesitant or, or, you know, to, to concede, was it, was the hesitancy to concede that there was a policy? Like when Kristen Nielsen says like, we have no policy of separation children. Is she really just covering her own uh, ass there as opposed to, because I would imagine like if the idea is we want to have such a draconian response to uh, you coming to seek asylum, you would want that publicized, right? I mean, because if people don't know I, I, it, that I don't, I, you know, you have to ask her, you would have to ask her and I don't know because she won't, she, she won't answer me. She, I don't have her on the record in this book about this, but she's talked a little bit publicly about this where she, uh, again, I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist or whatever, I, but it seems to me she's really parsing words. Cause remember she said in the height of it, we don't have a separation, a family separation policy period. She tweeted it out. And I responded at the time with the three facepalm emojis. Cause it was like, I was standing on the border looking at them separate children from their parents invited by her own department of Homeland security. Um, uh, why are they pursuing it today? Um, because they can, and they don't want to let it go, and they still believe that they need to be punitive in order to deter migration. And they are, by the way. You know, it, it, because the only reason there that there aren't more people here at risk of separation is because most children are being turned ar around immediately now and not even let into the country, right. and most parents or single adults are being made to wait in Mexico under this MPP program 
where they're not even allowed to uh, they basically get into the country and they're turned around and put back into the border cities and said, hey, show up for your court date, sometimes hundreds of miles away. So there just aren't the volume of people in the custody of the federal government now. It's like 25,000 in ICE custody versus 50,000 at the height and 1,000 kids in HHS custody versus 10,000 plus when I was on the border during separations. There are just not enough families here now to, to, to separate the same volume. But the reason the ones are at risk of separation right now is that Judge Dolly G from California, where I am, ordered the release of the children under the Flores Settlement Agreement, saying it's dangerous to have them in there during COVID. Um, But she doesn't have the authority to release the parents, order the release of the parents. And so it's up to the administration or ICE. They have the discretion. They could do it right now as we're talking. They could do it before the end of this interview, release the parents and children together. Um, But they've chosen not to do that and instead are trying to work out a scenario where there's a waiver uh, where the parents can sign away uh, the right to their children to let the child be released into the interior, placed with a sponsor, um, or be deported with their kid or stay indefinitely detained um, in the in the custody of the federal government, which is, again, this is they're just pursuing the same goals they have all along to indefinite detention or immediate expulsion. And, and how many of those uh, parents, uh, I mean, do you know, are saying, oh, okay, I'll be separated from my children? Zero. Zero. They tried to do it in May. There's a spreadsheet I posted on Twitter. Not a single one chose, you won't be surprised, to separate. And they said that they prefer to stay detained with their child when presented with the opportunity. Who would want to be separated from your child? You know? Uh, nobody. Because it creates lifelong trauma. Juan, the father in the book, texted me when I was in Yuma, where he crossed um, with the president a couple weeks ago and said to me, if you see Trump, ask him a question. Why did you separate us and traumatize us psychologically? You know, this is not rocket science, what separation does to parents and children. I got two kids. You know, you don't have to think very long about whether or not you'd want to be separated um, from your child. And it's backed up by, by medical science. Why? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think, um, I mean, I, I imagine it's possible for people to, to contemplate it if they don't have children, but for folks with children, it's, um, you know, um, it, it becomes, you know, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, you want a lot. I mean, we were all arm. kids. Right. We were all kids. The idea to be, of being separated from your parents. Right. Um, you know, it's just anybody that thinks that this is a, Human, anybody with any semblance of a moral compass or any type of humanity inside them, um, I don't understand how you could consider this as something you'd present to parents and children, even if the child went to live with an aunt or an uncle or a brother or a cousin or whatever. Like, it's your parent, and you're going to leave the parent locked up for the simple act, not of committing a felony, but of coming to the country in order to seek asylum, fleeing violence in the first place. Jacob Sabroff, the book is Separated Inside an American Tragedy, a very important read. Um, We will put a link to it at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. And again, um, congratulations on the book and I really appreciate the work that you did uh, in in, in reporting it in real time and ultimately uh, putting it together as a book. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for, for obviously diving deep into this. I really appreciate it. All right, folks, 